Special summoning is kind of what Yu-Gi-Oh's revolved around for several years now. Some cards set themselves apart in power by being able to bring out a ton of monsters to your board at once. So let's go over the best of them right now. And starting us off at number 10, we have Cyberjar. This is a level 3 Dark Rock Flip monster. Its effect is that on flip, it'll destroy all monsters in the field and make both players reveal the top 5 cards of their deck, and then special summon all level 4 or lower monsters they find there. Then add the rest of those cards to their hands. Cyberjar might be a really old monster, but when it comes to making you go plus, it beats basically every other card on this list. Not only does it have the potential to clear an opponent's full board of monsters, it's always going to give you at least 5 new cards to work with, and that was only somewhat balanced because your opponent got them as well. Either way, what Cyberjar does is throw a game into complete disarray, as each player gets an infusion of card advantage to clutter up the match. Though this effect is game winning, that could be the case for either you or your opponent, making it one of the riskiest cards ever printed. Cyberjar saw play in a ton of old school lists as a reversal tool, as if you manage to resolve it during your own turn, you're probably going to be able to win the game then and there. But it and Morphing Jar could have such an effect on the game that they both came out limited for us in the TCG. But Cyber was so much more powerful than its counterpart that it wouldn't be long until it got banned. While it was legal, attacking into an unknown face down was one of the scariest things you could do, as while setting your hand would play around Morphing Jar, committing cards to the board would be much worse if it was a Cyber Jar instead. Nowadays, this card is allowed at 1 again, but with how unusable flip effects have become in the past decade, it's only notable enough to get the 10th spot on this list. And now at number 9, we have DDD Wave King Caesar. This is a rank 4 water attribute XCs that can only be made with 2 level 4 fiend type monsters. As a quick effect, it can detach material from itself in order to allow you to special summon as many monsters ever destroyed this turn as possible when the battle phase ends. But then you take 1000 damage for each of them during the next standby phase. Also, if this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can add a dark contract card from your deck to your hand. Wave King Caesar makes this list as one of the most commonly made DDD XCs, being useful both inside and outside of the strategy. That said, it was never really because of its graveyard revival effect. Though it does have the potential to bring back a whole field that you had wiped previously with a torrential tribute, that was much less likely to come up than just using it as a combo enabler. Wave King Caesar could be used to trigger the DDD's effects of Special Summon from the Graveyard, which was crucial for their combos, and then be used as a fusion material to net you a surge when it hit the Graveyard. As the 1 rank 4 DDD, it could also be used to rank into Marksman King Tell, which is yet another DD monster being used for the deck's extension effects. This ability to slap an XCs on top of another one would become much more coveted once their new XCs came out, as it can also be summoned on top of King Tell, as well as Zeus, as it lets you get two activations of the cards off of going into a single rank 4. The release of these two new cards would also make it so the fiend focused decks such as Labyrinth would also start running Caesar, as it could now greatly help with your plays when going both first and second. And at number 8, we have Hysteric Party. This is a continuous trap that requires a discard to be activated, and it lets you special summon as many copies of Harpy Late as possible from your graveyard. But when this card leaves the field, they all get destroyed. If there was one thing no one expected during the XCs era, it would be that Harpies of all things would be meta. This anime archetype managed to get some of the craziest examples of legacy support ever, making them go from a pretty mediocre series of cards to a competent XC spam strategy. This was in no small part due to Hysteric Party. In an age where Call the Haunted had only recently started to leave the list, this card could be as many as 5 Call the Haunteds at once. Even though it lists specifically Harpy Lady as a target, the Harpy deck is filled with cards that treat themselves as Harpy Lady while in the graveyard. This included Harpy Channeler, the deck's best opening play, as well as Harpy Queen both of which had discard effects that would fuel into this card even more. Though the rank 4 pool wasn't nearly as good as it is now, Harpies uniquely had access to some of the best really good options due to their typing and attribute, like Zero Fine and Lightning Chidori. Due to Channeler's level modulation effect, they also had access to the rank 7 pool, containing some of the strongest XCs of the time like Dracosac. All of this as well as a very easily searchable in archetype back row removal, back when people played MST at 3 in every deck, really made this deck stand out from all the others. As the one strategy with an archetypal soul charge, Harpies enjoyed their place in the meta for a while, up until the actual soul charge came out, at which point other combo decks were much better at abusing the card and took over their niche completely. And at number 7, we have Generator Boss Stage. Its first effect triggers whenever a card is added from your opponent's deck to their hand, and it lets you special summon a generator monster from your deck. Additionally, if you special summon a generator monster during your opponent's turn, it lets you special summon to your field as many generator tokens as possible in attack position, but they get destroyed during the end phase. Token generators have always been ridiculously good since Link Monsters came out, as can be seen with how badly Tomahawk wrecked the format while it was around. But boss stage gets around the main problem with such a card by only filling your field during your opponent's turn. This card's effect will always trigger during your opponent's draw phase, as that counts as a card getting added from their deck to their hand. 
and gives you a free generator as well as fodder for its effects. The scariest of all of them being Har, which is both an Omni Negate and also has an effect to rip a card out of your opponent's hand, a la Dark Law. This double interaction off of a single card was enough to let the deck attain rogue status for a while, though it was always held back by the fact that you had to fill your deck with those level 9s with no inherent summoning conditions, and didn't help that boss stage cannot summon from the hand either. The monsters all being level 9s was also a pretty nice trait to have while VFD was still legal, as the card essentially locked your opponent out of the game for a turn, but this wasn't nearly enough to make this deck meta as Virtual World was always the best at turboing it out. A lot of this deck's issues would have been solved with their newly released support, Vala and Levitate, which give them both a great way to use 9 stuck in your hand, as well as a great extra deck monster to end on. Though they did allow the deck to get a couple of tops and smaller events in the modern age, the power level is still a tad too high for them to thrive now. And at number 6, we have Super Ancient Deep Sea Coelacanth, a level 7 waterfish monster with 2800 attack, whose effects let you discard a card to special summon as many level 4 or lower fish monsters from your deck as possible, but they cannot declare attacks and their effects are negated. Also, if this card is targeted by a card effect, you can tribute another fish monster to negate the effect and destroy that card. For how old this card is, Coelacanth packs one of the most powerful kinds of effects ever printed, being able to bring out any number of monsters straight from your deck. The only things holding this card back were that it's a high level monster with no inherent summon condition, and that fish monsters were incredibly lackluster even back then. Still, being able to eat Telly for 4 was enough of a reward to lure several players to try and make it work. This card would become the centerpiece of a whole strategy once the Synchro Era had settled in, in the so called Fish OTK. The usual combo would be to use Coelacanth to bring out Royal Swamp Eel, Metabo Shark, Fishborg Blaster, and Oyster Master. The biggest conversion for all this fodder was the Armory Arm Colossal OTK, which can kill your opponent from basically any amount of life points by equipping Armory Arm to their guy and repeatedly crashing Colossal Fighter into it. This setup was even somewhat flexible, allowing you to also make a Stardust Dragon to protect the combo, or even a second Armory Arm to get kills through even on weaker monsters. With all of this said, this combo was still awfully hard to assemble. The most common way to get Coelacanth out was to Tribute Summon it, which meant the deck was basically forced to play the Frog Engine to try to get it going. Having to spend so many resources to get into it also made Coelacanth a huge target for any of the commonly used back row, so you were almost required to have back row wipe to go alongside it. Lastly, with so many otherwise useless fish monsters in the deck, the deck would often brick and couldn't play much defense. Despite all of this, the deck did see a moderate amount of success before the Armory Armorata, and Konami wouldn't print a card quite like this until several years later. And at number 5, we have Phantasmal Lord Ultimate Holbish Balkan. This is a Dark Dragon Synchro monster with no actual level, but its effects makes it so this card's original level is always treated as 12. It cannot be Synchro Summoned, and you must Special Summon it from your extra deck by sending two level 8 or higher monsters you control with the same level to the graveyard, with one being a tuner and the other being a non-tuner. This card cannot be destroyed by card effects, and it gains 1000 attack for each monster on the field. During the main phase, its effects let you Special Summon as many level 1 fiend type tokens with zero attack and defense as possible to both players' fields in defense position, but this card cannot attack this turn. Despite being the evolved form of Ultimaya to Zulkin, Bishbalkin would hardly see any play unlike its lower level counterpart. Though, getting a level 5 or higher tuner was never the hardest thing out there, especially with cards like Quick Draw Synchron and Go Fu the Vague Shadow being around, the task gets upped in difficulty dramatically when it comes to a level 8 one. Pretty much the only deck able to bring this card out for a really long time was Infernoids through Decatron's level modulation effect. But even there, Bishbalkin was a rather rare tech that would only come up once in every 50 games. However, this card would finally find a niche for itself later after the release of Synchros, though not in the way you'd usually imagine. This card does have the potential of giving you 5 tokens to use as a link material for anything you'd want, but the tokens being given to your opponent as well makes it far too awkward for any combo deck to use, as your opponent will always have 5 fodder to work with during their next turn. This downside would be a non-issue in the strategy that did decide to pick it up though, an FTK. The way this works is that Bish Balkan would reach a stupidly high attack boost once its effect resolves which you can then give to your opponent with Geonator Transversor, then use Chronomaly Machu Mech on it, which inflicts damage to your opponent equal to the difference between the monster's original attack and their current attack, totaling in over 8,000 damage on the first turn. Though this did get a couple of tops in its time, the fragility of the combo would end up pushing it out entirely with barely any time to shine. And at number 4, we have Junk Speeder. This is a level 5 Synchro Wind Warrior monster that must be with a Synchron Tuner and one or more non-tuner monsters. If this card is Synchro Summoned, you can Special Summon as many Synchron Tuners at different levels from your deck as possible in defense position, but then you get locked into Synchro Monsters the turn you activate this effect. 
Also, if this card that was Synchro Summon this turn battles another monster, you can make this card's attack become double its original attack until the end of the turn. Junk Speeder is one of those archetypal extenders that reads straight up like a custom card. It's able to bring any number of Synchron tuners from your deck, with the only restriction that you're locked into the deck's main summoning method anyways. The biggest issue with this monster used to be that it was first released during Master Before, it just didn't work under that. Since you couldn't make multiple synchros without any arrows, and this card's effects prevent you from going into links at all during the turn you bring it out, there were never really any payoffs for resolving it, as even the strongest synchro monsters would require multiple synchro monsters to be made. However, the coming of Master Rule 5 would only serve to show everyone the real problem with this card. When the whole deck is based around resolving Junk Speeder, any way to negate it is obviously going to be extremely impactful. And so the overabundance of hand traps being thrown around would stiffen this deck entirely. Though Ash Blossom can be played around as Junk Converter can chain block it, the deck never really had a way to beat Valor, Imperm, or Nibiru, three of the most played cards in almost every meta since. Still, with how many new cards both Synchrons and Synchros in general have received, its combo is pretty much always an instant win if it resolves. And so the deck managed to get its first top this year when mixed with Adventure Engine to make sure your plays would go through. Next up at number 3, we have Xyz Encore. This is a quick play spell which lets you target a face-up Xyz monster your opponent controls that has materials and detach all materials from it. Then that monster gets sent back to the extra deck, and if it's materials that were monsters hit the graveyard, you can spell to some of those monsters your opponent's side of the field in defense position, but their levels are reduced by one. Oh, also, cards and effects cannot be activated in response to this card. Xyz Encore was yet another great TCG exclusive to be released in 2013, coming off not long after limitation of compulsory evacuation device. Not unlike Compulse, this card offers non-destruction removal and quick effects, but it comes with a few caveats. Of course, it can only hit Xyz, and your opponent does get the materials back to the field, but these weren't nearly enough to make this card not see play. Since all the monsters get downgraded a level forever, it's not likely they will be able to use these bodies on the field again, turning them into empty advantage. Xyz Encore began seeing play right after its release as a side deck staple in Dragon Ruler format. One of the most common budget ways to directly counter rulers was to play Evil Swarms, since they had very easy access to Ophion, who stops all special summons for monsters that are level 5 or higher, as long as it has material. And all rulers are level 7. What made this card an absolute pain to deal with was its other effect, which lets you search out an infestation spell. Meaning you'd also get access to Infestation Pandemic to make Ophion unaffected by most back row at quick effect speed. This is where Encore came in, as it removed Ophion and couldn't be responded to by Pandemic. This card saw on and off play in the side to remove annoying XCs ever since, showing up again as pretty much the only way to deal with Rongo Miniat. Even though Rongo is unaffected by card effects while it has no materials, They've ruled it so that Encore affects the Xyz materials and not the monster itself. Thus, it works even on towers-like cards. This card was actually seen a decent amount of play as soon as last format to out Rise Heart and Expertly Noir, as their materials would either get banished or be mostly spells respectively, so your opponent wouldn't get enough summons to overwhelm you anyways. And coming at number 2, we have World Sea Dragon Zelantis. This is a Link 4 Water Sea Serpent with 2500 attack and can be made with one or more effect monsters. You can only control a single copy of this card, and during the main phase you can banish all monsters on the field and then special summon as many monsters that were banished by this effect as possible back to their owner's field face up or in face down defense position. Its last effect only triggers during the battle phase, where as a quick effect you can destroy cards on the field up to the number of co-linked monsters on the board. Zelantis is one of the most unique Link 4s out there, as it actually only requires a single monster to be made. What this means is that you can make this card off of another Link 4, so, you can turn a spent Appaloosa or negated Axis code into an entirely new monster. This did have the potential to be splashed into any deck which could link climb, but its effects weren't useful enough for it to be worth a slot. People then looked at this card as a way to trigger the effects of monsters with no hard ones per turn effects to use them multiple times, such as Ignister Prominence. This ended up being the card's first home, in Pendulum, where it worked greatly, especially when going second. However, as that deck went out of the meta, Zelantis would then go on to become heavily associated with Marine Cess instead. Because the deck runs not one, but two archetypal Link 4s, it has a really easy time going into it. However, the best part about using it there is that Marine Cess always locks itself into water monsters with Marine Cess Coral Anemone. The way this interacts with Zelantis is that its effects does banish all monsters in both players' fields and then brings them back, but since you are the one doing the summoning, you were unable to bring back non-water monsters. This doesn't do anything for you as your whole deck is water attribute, but if you banish any of your opponent's monsters with this card, odds are they're not waters, and thus will stay banished forever, making this into a free field wipe for the deck. Marine Cess is a pretty respectable rogue strategy to this day, having access to one card combos as well as a ton of space for hand traps. 
And finally, at number 1, we have Rekindling. This is a normal spell card that lets you special summon as many fire monsters from your graveyard with exactly 200 defense as possible, but then they get banished during the end phase. With the least amount of tax out of all the other cards in this list, we have Rekindling, which was the closest we'd get to Soul Charge before that card came out. Rekindling has no cost or restrictions, with the only stipulation that it can only target fire monsters with 200 defense, which is actually a quite popular theme amongst fire monsters. The downside is always negligible, since these monsters can just be used for extra deck plays before the end phase comes around. Now, with how powerful this card is, people have made several attempts at making Rekindling work. The first of which was together with the Flameveil engine. With Fire Dog and Magician both being targets, as well as Dog being able to summon the Magician straight from the deck, you got access to a powerful Synchro engine. With level 8s being some of the strongest at the time, being able to get them off of a single card with either Rekindling or the Dog gave this deck a lot of explosive power. Later on, we'd see Rekindling being used as a payoff for Lovels, being able to foolish a ton of fires with 200 defense at the graveyard very quickly. With this card allowing you to end on a Quasar in an age where no deck was really equipped to deal with it. The issue with both these decks is that they more or less relied fully on rekindling for their cards to actually be good, and so would be pretty far behind other strategies if they didn't get their unsearchable powerful spell card into their hand. Rekindling would reach its peak at the 3-axis Firefist decks, with just enough targets to make the card work, as well as more options to convert the extra bodies into playing both Synchros and Axes. This was when rekindling was so good it had to be limited on the list, a hit that would look pretty silly as Soul Charge came out only a month later. This card would keep seeing play as the boneless version of the better spell for a while in decks such as Fire Kings, which had a couple of very good targets, and Infernoids, which had their best monster as one. Fittingly, this card just kind of fizzled off after Infernoids were in the meta, as not only did these kinds of unsearchable bombs become harder to utilize in a faster metagame, but also because Konami hasn't really printed any archetypes to take advantage of it. Still, there's no denying how strong this card used to be, being the most impactful of its kind to never get banned at some point in time. And there's no telling when we'll get an archetype that might put this card on the list again. Alright, and that's the list. If you happen to know of any other cards you may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.